And in that uh, vein, I wanted to try to outline not so much some concrete, hardcore results today, <clears throat> but to outline some of the things we've been thinking about in terms of uh, Nowakian Hesperian crater degradation and the processes and potential effects. You can see from the previous talks that we've we've been trying to do a multi-prong uh, approach to addressing many of the critical issues that come out of um, uh, this whole question of what was the early Martian climate like? Was it warm and wet? Was it cold and icy? What are the major processes? How do we recognize them? Uh, and craters um, are one of the major landforms, of course, that we can get to not only assess their formational processes, but their modification and degradational processes as clues uh, to the climate. So that's what I want to try to do today. And I invite all of you to um, you know, participate here because th these are really um, big issues. We're attacking them in a multifaceted front, but um, we need all the help we can get, obviously, as we all do to resolve these major issues. So let me just point out uh, for frame of reference here um, uh, why landform degradation is uh, so critical and the kinds of issues that we can uh, address here, sort of a background. So, uh, you know, landforms and the degradation, you know, they're one of the most critical witnesses to climate and its evolution on the Earth. That's well known. All of you are totally aware of that. Um, and landforms are produced by dynamic processes, obviously, uh, tectonic, volcanic, and impact that they basically push out of equilibrium uh, and form landforms um, uh, that are out of equilibrium with the ambient processes uh, that ultimately cause their uh, erosion and planation. So, you know, this is all well known to everyone but it's important to kind of get the same frame of reference here. And if we think about the Earth, it's the ambient processes are really primarily climate related. They're physical and chemical weathering, and they're also tectonic uh, from subduction. So we know from just looking at this wonderful picture taken by Apollo 17 astronaut Jack Schmidt of the Earth, um, you can see, in fact, the significance of the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, um, the atmosphere, the water vapor in the atmosphere, variations, et cetera. Uh, so this is what's doing the heavy lifting in terms of erosion and degrading the very landforms that are created in a form of the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayas, and so on, down so that they ultimately look like the middle of some of these continents here. And we know that these processes um, basically vary. This diagram here is really interesting. Um, basically, we're talking about uh, essentially uh, uh, the mean uh, annual uh, temperature here on one axis and the mean and the precipitation. This is what subdivides the various climate subzones that you see here, okay, into arid, semi arid, paraglacial, humid, temperate, selva, and so on. And so we also see these not just varying as a function of latitude, as you can painfully see here. You wouldn't want to be stuck in the middle of the Sahara Desert there, but uh, in fact, as a function of altitude, as shown by, uh, by the Sierra Nevada Mountains in, um, in, in Spain. Uh, you can see here the change in environment as a function of altitude, and this is the adiabatic cooling effect kicking in uh, snow and ice deposited on the high mountains, and then essentially there's an olive grove here uh, at the lower altitudes. So this is critical, um, and we know that the other major degradational modificational source is that subduction, uh, the complement of divergent plate boundaries, destroys a significant amount of the record. <clears throat> so these same type of um, approaches of assessing these in the in and, out of, in and out of equilibrium have, of course, been successfully applied to other planets, particularly <laughs> to the most common landform, which is impact craters and their degradation. So this is basically just a, a general background. Um, so when we think about <clears throat> going to the moon, okay, it's very different. Uh, it's a one plate planet. That is, it's a single global lithospheric plate. So subduction is not an option. And the, essentially surface is very stationary uh, and there's no atmosphere. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, Carl Sagan used to say, uh, meaning <clears throat> not the physical atmosphere, but the mental atmosphere. Um, our, uh, the moon has no atmosphere, uh, he meant in the uh, psychological sense, it's a burnt out sender. Uh, I beg to differ with that, but anyway, it is what it is. So ambient degradational processes there are almost totally related to the external impact or flux. And this, we had a great discussion on this yesterday with David Menton and others about the flux and how um, this is doing the degradation in highlands and Mari, and particularly in terms of small cratering processes and uh, essentially diffusional degradational processes. So this is really important because it, it cancels out a lot of things and we can study the impact process itself. Uh, we also know that the impact process is extremely energetic, okay? It simultaneously both forms and destroys landscapes. Um, you can see that here. Here's a beautiful, this is Theophilus crater and here's some other craters around it that essentially have 
uh, suffered the fate of superposed impacts and in, indeed the distal ejecta, proximal ejecta of Theophilus as well. So it simultaneously forms and degrades and it's scale dependent. It goes from zap pits here to multi-ring basins that you can see here. Uh, it also varies in time. There's a time integrated flux dependent aspect uh, to, to, uh, to, um, to the process, okay? And of course, <laughs> the good news is that um, there's lots of them to study. This is a paper published in Science that we did a couple of years ago where we took the LOLA data and made really good measurements of all the diameter distributions of craters above 20 kilometers on the moon. And you can see a couple of things here. There are a lot of them, many, many thousands. Not only that, but the density varies, varies and this is of course related to age. These are the younger Mari, Mari Embryum, et cetera. And you can see that in fact, um, they have fewer craters on top than the more ancient terrains. So how is crater degradation manifested in these kinds of environments? Well, some years ago, in, um, <clears throat> actually many years ago, in 1975, uh, I, I assessed this from lunar orbiter data and wrote a paper, I was in third grade at the time, of course, um, uh, on processes of lunar degradation, changes in style with geological time. I was really struck with the fact of how slow impact cratering modification processes were in a environment like we see, such as we see today in the low flux environment. So I divided things up into two periods. Period one was prior to about 3.9 billion years ago. This is characterized by a high influx rate and by formation of large multi-ring basins. But this period, the second period, 3.9 billion years, okay, um, is in fact characterized by much lower influx rate, it's well known, and it also has really a lack of large multi-ring basins. I mean, it, it does, because only the Oriental post-dates embryum uh, in, in the earliest embryum period. So craters formed throughout period two show subtle changes in morphology, morphological characteristics with time. So in the Copernican, they're characterized about eight gig years, 0.8 gig years. They're characterized by the presence of rays. This is how Shoemaker defined them originally. In Eratosthenian period, uh, about 3.3 uh, giga years ago, um, at the beginning, um, by the loss of rays. But, you know, we, we had a lot of really great discussions yesterday with Cassie and Veronica and Bill McKinnon and others about what, could you see the differences in some of this floppy ejecta, um, uh, you know, that in fact uh, was impact melt, I mean, between Tycho and Copernicus and so on. So just the fact that we had that long argument means that the cratering rates, you know, Tycho is tens of millions and, uh, you know, Copernicus is of the order of maybe uh, uh, 800 or so. Uh, and so, you know, that says something about that rate. And the embryon, even in embryon craters, okay, they're largely undegraded. Um, they've lost their primary crater floor roughness. Um, they, uh, some of the ejecta isn't as clear, but indeed this is what characterizes period two degradation. It's really small scale degradation. It doesn't really have much to do with loss of central peaks. Basically, you're degrading the small scale landscape here with the large scale, long wavelength uh, landscapes really remain pretty unscathed from a crater degradation point of view. Uh, so this means that very subtle morphology and morphometry changes over 87% year, of lunar history. That, that's really remarkable when you think about it. And there are local perturbations that are due to proximity weathering. I called it proximity weathering at the time. I prefer now proximity degradation. Uh, as you can see in that slide of Theophilus, if you're standing next to, well, I'm, everyone knows that if you wanted to witness, it's like that BC cartoon. I'd really like to see one of those uh, bolides come in and hit the earth. And of course, one hits him on the head and from underneath the bolide, you hear a little balloon coming out that says, I really had in mind side view. You really want a side view on these things, but even a side view is gonna result in proximity degradation and modification from the ejecta deposits, even of these uh, craters that are of the kilometer scale, not the hundreds of kilometer scale. So if we look at this then, we have essentially the lunar history, okay, uh, essentially the pre and uh, and then this whole period here, 87% is the period two, it's looking kind of like this, and you know, not a lot of degradation is going on at that point. So what goes on in period one? Well, this is when, in fact, the first 13% of lunar history, this, this is when you see a hell of a lot of crater degradation. It almost appears overnight. And that's what struck me when I wrote this paper was, 
um, you know, <laughs> you go back in time and then all of a sudden it's lights out. I mean, it's like, it's not the same anymore. And what is the reason for that? Uh, well, clearly it's basin proximity degradation is a major factor there. Obviously the increased flux is important too, but it's, base, it's basically proximity degradation from the basins. So if you think about this then, um, what we see in these craters is a decrease in crater depth. This is, um, uh, this is uh, yes, this is this crater right here. It is not, it is uh, Hipparchus. Um, so if you take a look here, you can see a decrease in crater depth, uh, essentially increase in crater floor width. Uh, this only requires small amounts of fill to make happen. Primary source of the crater degradation, it's the formation of these multi-ring basins. So here's Imbrium, here's the central highlands. And if you take a look here, you can actually map out these processes. And what you see here is widespread associated ballistic sedimentation represented by these areas produces near saturation bombardment. And this, it's not only the fact that you have a lot of craters coming in, this excavates and mobilizes large volumes of local material and preferentially moves it uh, into nearby low regions. Here you can see radially textures, you can see the crater chains across here, and all this debris has come in on top and buried those, okay? And so the bottom line is we also have seismic effects. And Misha Kreslovsky and I wrote a paper some time ago where we showed that Oriental has unique roughness characteristics. We attributed that to the fact that um, essentially the seismic effects had gone and modified uh, all the surrounding areas, but then the ejecta came down and had a primary roughness that was destroyed in earlier craters. This, this um, seismic effects also enhanced slope instabilities and they mobilized materia for downslope movement. So basin proximity degradation, major importance in degradation and modification, generation of interior crater fill and formation of these Cayley type planes, smooth planes across the planet. Well, what about Mars? It's a one plate planet with atmosphere and climate. Okay, so it's a combination of the moon, if you will. Uh, we also know that atmospheric pressure is extremely low today. It's changed with time, six millibars today, a bar or plus in the Noachian, and we still don't know. Uh, people assume a bar, I think largely because that's what we have on the earth. It's good enough for us, it's good enough for Mars. And we also have Mars climate, which has changed with time. We know that. What's the canonical view of crater degradation? It is that, in fact, aqueous processes and climate-related processes modified craters. This is from um, a, it's typical of what we find, um, you know, in the uh, essentially um, Craddock and Howard type uh, activity uh, papers. Uh, craters are degraded with time. Um, uh, and you see, in fact, a primary crater being degraded, much like we see it here. Uh, and then, of course, later on, this decreases in intensity. And by the, Noachian, the Hesperian and the Amazonian, there's very little uh, degradation. Um, so if we take a look here, then, at the climate history, then, we think, based on the Amazonian, Hesperian, and Noachian, that the Amazonian was extremely cold in the area. And this is supported by the uh, mineralogical data. There was a transitional climate here. Uh, and indeed, the Noachian was warm and wet, okay, because we have the valley networks, open and closed basin lakes, and we have these clays, okay? So that's kind of the picture. And if we take a look at the hydrological system, uh, today it's horizontally stratified, probably was horizontally stratified in Hesperian. But if this is all true, then it's vertically integrated here with rains, rainfall, infiltration, with groundwater, groundwater outflow, et cetera, an active hydrological cycle from a vertically integrated point of view. So what do we see? We've already talked about valley networks. We've always talked about open and closed basin lakes. And indeed, these would are interpreted by a number of people as being related to a vertically integrated hydrological system. And we see uh, the distribution of these lakes and valley networks here. And we also see degraded craters. And this is critically important because indeed, degraded craters, um, uh, the differences between what is seen later on in, in uh, geological history on Mars and what's seen in the Noachian uh, is, in, is uh, interpreted to be due to the relatively high erosion rates. And these have uh, been in Craddock and Howard and Irwin and co-workers, et cetera, and a bunch of really excellent detailed papers show uh, that they interpret it to be uh, landform degradation by rainfall, fluvial activity in a warmer, wetter climate uh, with a late Noachian climate optimum resulting in fluvial erosion uh, and formation of abundant valley networks. Indeed, as they say, degraded craters are one of the main lines of evidence for a warmer climate on early Mars. Well, Let's put this into the context of the geological perspective and a diagram, which we'll come back to briefly here, uh, which is temperature in Kelvin and uh, time in, along this axis, 
the Noachian 400 million years early, middle, and late, moving into the Hesperian. The geologic perspective from these papers here, Moore, Andrews, Hanna, and others, um, would have 273K, this is critical, so mean annual temperature is in a warm and wet semi-arid arid environment. Sustained background climate in this MAT range. Early on, the infiltration rate, sorry, the precipitation rate does not exceed uh, the, the does not exceed the infiltration rate, and so it soaks into the ground and rain splash is a dominant diffusive degradation mechanism, whereas later on in this terminal epoch of intense activity, the rainfall rate exceeds the ability of the infiltration capacity, and so uh, one gets runoff. So again, this is a vertically integrated hydrological system. The problem is that this flies in the face of the climate models, okay? Climate models, particularly based on a faint young sun, would have not a vertically integrated hydrological system like this, but indeed a horizontally stratified one with a global cryosphere. Basically, what these predict is, because of the faint young sun, about 70% of its present luminosity, mean annual temperature will be 227K, really cold, okay? And any water vapor here, because of the atmosphere being denser, will undergo the adiabatic cooling effect, will snow out in the highlands, and Mars will look like this above a plus one kilometer equilibrium line altitude. So what that, <laughs> when you look at that, that's not up here, that's down here. Not only is it down here, but it's here, okay? It's way down at 225K. The climate modeling perspective is horizontally stratified, snow and ice here, and cold and sustained icy background. How in the hell can we reconcile that with this geological perspective, okay? This is a real problem. Geologists like myself oftentimes say, well, it's just another climate model. Twiddle the knobs, and you'll get it right sooner or later. But these are really robust models, okay? These, in fact, are two very different interpretations of the same data based on climate models here and a, a faint young sun. So how do we reconcile these? And don't, don't think these are not, don't think, oh, it's just a little bit of each, because here's what the water would look like on the surface. Uh, this is a portrayal of a warm and wet early Mars with a huge northern lowland ocean. This is the alternative, the cold and icy, uh, et cetera. So we're talking about something different. And the question, of course, is do we need continuous warm and wet conditions? Could we have icy and cold conditions with periodic perturbations uh, on this theme? So this is the parameter space we're looking at at the present time. And I just want to outline here uh, a number of quick questions that we're addressing. So this is the plan of attack, and I encourage you to take a look at some of these problems. We obviously need all the, uh, the help we can get. Uh, we need to look at the magnitude of the impact flux. We need to look at the intensity required for infiltration. What's a transition to runoff? What causes abrupt change from highly degraded craters to less degraded craters, Dean of the Noachian? Basin-related torrential downfalls, which Ashley, uh, in her paper earlier, uh, we talked about. What about explosive and effusive uh, volcanism, as we heard about a little earlier here? This could be really important, okay, because this is the period of Hesperian late Noachian volcanism. Do we see any evidence for Noachian glaciation? And what are the impacts for crater modification and degradation state? What about aeolian processes and a denser climate? There's a paper that came out in JGR Planets today, which showed that we could even get mega dunes that are migrating uh, today. So imagine what they were doing then. And what about transient heating phenomena in an otherwise cold and icy climate? So we saw earlier, and I'm lurching towards the end here, but we saw earlier that in fact, in the Noachian, uh, in the early Noachian, it's clear that major basins are having an effect. They really are a significant factor here in terms of this uh, intense uh, uh, period of hydrological activity that could last from the event up to a few hundred years. Uh, we know that this could account potentially for the phyllosilicate alteration, and that it's separated from the later Noachian uh, valley network formation. So the climate modeling perspective then is um, that in fact, it's a cold and icy uh, climate. And one of the factors we're looking at is there periodic perturbations that could in fact bring mean annual temperature of 225K up to the melting point and above for a sustained period of time that could permit uh, the formation of valley networks by melting of snow and ice here. And we're kind of thinking that this might be the case because if you look at the characteristics of this snow and ice scenario, you look at the distribution of valley networks, closed basin lakes, and open basin lakes, they're very highly correlated here. And in fact, we found one which appears to be internal drainage, which may also be related to glaciation. So this is one of the areas that we're investigating and looking at these. There's also uh, an abundance of characteristics of Amazonian craters, which give us clues as to what ice 
what crater degradation and formation mechanisms uh, will look like in an ancient climate. Uh, Clark Chapman years ago did many interesting um, studies and papers on uh, the crater degradation uh, and, and missing craters on part of the population, et cetera. Uh, we're pursuing that as an option as well uh, to try to apply our knowledge of what happens in these younger climates uh, to how it might map out in the cold and icy climate. So let me just say that uh, this is a multi-pronged approach. We have a number of different people with different perspectives who are working towards this. Um, we don't have an answer. You know, it's a really big parameter space, very wide uh, and very interesting. Um, and we're chipping away at it a little bit at a time. I think I would say at the end of uh, today uh, that this talk that I think there's reasonable um, possibility that we could be looking at a cold and icy background climate that was per perturbed from time to time by transient events that cause uh, melting. And the question is, do you get long enough transient event with enough melting? Five field seasons in Antarctica, and I can tell you that peak daytime temperature, it's 253K mean annual temperature in Antarctica, but we see profound evidence for peak daytime melting that can do real geomorphic work and create channels and lakes and ponds. So we're on the case here. We appreciate any comments and we need all the help we can get. Thanks a lot.